All right, y'all. So here we go. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Black to the Future Action Fund. Uh, conversation about economic recovery and Black America. And I could not be joined by two more amazing people than the Dr. Derek Hamilton, <laughs> as well as my sister, fierce fighter, and Black woman extraordinaire, <laughs> Erica Washington from Make It Work Nevada. Well, Make It Work, period, okay? But also based in Nevada. I wanna just start off by saying uh, thank you to everybody who's taken an opportunity to join us. Last month, we unveiled our mandate and it couldn't come at a better time. The mandate is called Build Back Boulder and it is a black mandate for the Biden-Harris administration. And it is a roadmap, a legislative roadmap for how it is that we make Black Lives Matter from City Hall all the way up to the Oval Office. Over the past few weeks, uh, the American Rescue Plan was signed into law in addition to 42 executive orders that were aimed at building back our democracy. There's still so much to do in order to make justice real for our communities. Today, you're going to hear from two excellent speakers, experts, visionaries, all the things about the economic issues that we're facing, the opportunity in front of us, and the mandate to address the challenges that keep our families left out and left behind. So what we need from you today right now is to join us. Please text MANDATE to 510, hey, Oakland, 510-405-4549. Again, that's 510-405-4549 to join our efforts to deliver a mandate from Black America. And thank you, as always, to Black to the Future Action Fund for convening us. Let me introduce our guests so we can go ahead and get started, okay? I want to start with Dr. Derek Hamilton. Dr. Hamilton is a university professor, the Henry Cohen Professor of Economics and Urban Policy, the founding director for the Institute of the Study of Race, Stratification, and Political Economy. Nation's foremost scholars, economists, and public intellectuals. His accomplishments include recently being profiled in the New York Times, Mother Jones Magazine, and the Wall Street Journal, and he was featured in Politico's 2017 50 Ideas Shaping American Politics and the People Behind Them issue. He is a member of the Marguerite Casey Foundation in partnership with the Group Health Foundation's inaugural class of Freedom Scholars. He's been involved in crafting policy proposals such as baby bonds and a federal job guarantee which served as inspirations for legislative proposals at the federal, state, and local levels. He's also served as a member of the Economic Committee of the Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force. Now, we don't have to ask you about that, Dr. Hamilton, because you know, <laughs> that is the ultimate popular front, my friend, but we're going to return to that in a second. <laughs> he has testified before several Senate and House committees, including the Joint Economic Committee on the nation's potential policy responses to relief and recovery from the Rona. <laughs> and he was also a surrogate and advisor for the Bernie Sanders presidential campaign. And he's advised numerous other leading members of Congress as well as various 2020 presidential candidates. Dr. Hamilton, let me start with you. We just did this whole long introduction to you, child, so now we gotta just jump into it. <laughs> Dr. Hamilton, frame this moment for us the economic moment for Black America through the contextualization of how we got here in the first place. In other words, right, what are we really dealing with when we're talking about Black folks in this country and the economy? Yeah, and first off, gratitude. Uh, I genuinely love being in space with you. And of those things you named, you forgot the name, I'm your friend. That, that to me is a, a thing that That's I wear absolutely proud. absolutely correct. <laughs> Um, but so the, the question, how did we get here? Uh, what is the state, right? I, I'd say, um, and, and basically, it is sad when one's race 
gender, sexual orientation has transactional value as it relates to material outcomes. And the way our society is structured is such that regardless of education, regardless of experience, that being black is associated with a greater likelihood of unemployment, less income, and a, a, a big attribute as to why that's true is the wealth gap itself. It, it is wealth itself. So probably the most paramount indicator of one's economic position is wealth. We know that if there is a pandemic and you're an essential worker and you have a pre-existing condition, you're vulnerable where you gotta go to work if you don't have any resources and economic security to sustain yourself. Right. Um, the biggest pre-existing condition of them all is wealth. So, okay. you know, we, we, don't, we don't talk about that. You know, I'll say a couple other things then I'll, I'll um, move on because I know we wanna make this conversational. We have lessons from the last great recession. What do we know? Inequality grew. We know there was a jobless recovery. We know that people got evicted. We know that there was um, foreclosures and we know certain communities got hit harder. And then here's something that's really pernicious. We told young people to go to college and wait out the recession. And they came out with record levels of debt as a result of that. And now they're about to be scarred twice, first by the Great Recession and now by this pandemic. So all those things I mentioned to you are worse if you're Black, the, are, are dramatically worse if you're Black. I'll, I'll give one, one last statistic. For millennials, they have lower home ownership rates as similarly aged generations dating all the way back to the greatest generation that was coming into their young adulthood right after the Great Depression. And what's more, the black-white inequality in home ownership rate for younger people is more pronounced than it's ever been since we've been recording it. So that's indicative of a regression. And if, if home ownership is indicative of one's ability to have wealth, then we know that um, if government doesn't act, and that's the key point, and I know we're going to get into that, this inequality and despair is not, it's not manifest. There are things we can do about it that can change it. Inequality and despair is a political choice, not an inevitability. Mm. It's bad policy and it's bad politics. I heard that today coming out of the, the uh, Roosevelt Institute and also uh, our friends over at Community Change. Let me ask you, Dr. Hamilton, break down for the people who are watching right now, what are the economic provisions of the American Rescue Plan? A lot of people just understand it as the stimmies. <laughs> but there's much more than the stimmies. In fact, there's like trillions of dollars that have been infused into the economy. How much of this is accessible to Black folks? How much of it is not? How should we understand what's in this rescue plan in the first place? So I'll list some key things and then, you know, I'm going to go to the framing that you put out there. Build Back Boulder is much better than Build Back Better Come because <laughs> this is an opportunity for us to be transformative. It's not enough to just get past this, this pandemic. And by the way, Biden administration should get credit that they're doing it better than the Obama administration when we had the Great Recession in that the amount that they're using to address our recovery and the targeted approach, literally sending people direct cash, that's unprecedented. And you know what's good about that? It's unprecedented. So that's it right. demonstrates <laughs> that we can actually do this thing. It's not that's pie right. in the sky. IRS, you know, we think of the IRS as simply tax revenue collection. The IRS can directly facilitate economic inclusion, social equity, and health, civic engagement. The, one of the things in this recovery is refundable child tax credits. Before, they weren't refundable. Why is it that if you don't have enough income, you don't get what's entitled to you? The IRS can directly send you money. You. And we can even extend that, and we can talk more about ideas of how we can extend it. Um, but really quick, what's in it? Well, they have extended unemployment assistance and expanded the definition of who qualifies. And by the way, that should be permanent. If you're an Uber driver, you should always be qualified for un un unemployment insurance. Uh, right. We have extended the moratorium on evictions and foreclosures. Now it's noteworthy that it's someday that bill's gonna come due. So uh, extending it is a good thing, but not enough because we have almost a benefits cliff waiting for us if, if we do nothing. Um, they have offered cash assistance to state and localities, and that's obviously important because 
they deliver critical services to communities that need it the most, Black communities, and they hire a lot of Black people. There's less discrimination in municipal jobs, probably because they have to follow rules when they hire than other types of jobs. So if, if we starve, starve the beast in states and localities don't have resources, then they're going to lay off Black people. And you know what? They'll get that revenue through fines and fees and incarcerate us more. So it's a real good thing that, that uh, they're, they're offering cash assistance there. And you know, um, I live in a Black neighborhood and a, and a COVID uh, vaccination site is near me. And so I'm going to appoint the Biden administration for that. They are proactively, it seems like, uh, trying to work with certain states, at least, to, to put in vaccination sets, uh, places in a more equitable way. And then, you know, the last thing is paycheck protection. They did that. But, but a key takeaway are two points. One, the unprecedented use of government power to demonstrate that they can directly intervene in a way to provide economic security to people is a good thing. Um, what's not, what, what we need to go further is, again, the framing that you put together. We need to be bolder and make this stuff permanent. There's no reason that just in a pandemic that we should have poverty. <laughs> that, you know, what's the direct way of ending poverty? Give people cash to the poor. By definition, they'll no longer be poor. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Listen, I want to move over to my sister, Erica. Erica, let me just do the introduction of you first, because, you know, we got things to say about you. So Erica Washington moved to the Las Vegas Valley more than a decade ago and instantly integrated herself into the community. Working for many years as a journalist for the only African-American newspaper in the state of Nevada, she came to appreciate and understand the inner workings of Nevada politics. She is currently the executive director of Make It Work Nevada and Make It Work Nevada Education Fund. And she strives to redefine the traditional idea of what organizing looks like. Since 2015, she has sought out to refocus old strategy ideas and adjust the view through both a gender and cultural lens. The organization is successfully organizing Black women and their families around important economic, racial, and reproductive justice issues that will have a long lasting effect on the political and cultural landscape of Nevada. Welcome, 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 Erica, what's up? I'm so glad to be here. And, you know, it, it's been so long since we've seen each other in person, but, you know, I should also add friend onto that long list of things. And, oh and, fan, and fan, because oh I, I appreciate Black Futures Lab and all of the work that you all have been doing over the past few years and, and including us, because I told someone not too long ago the story about how we uh, got involved with the Black Census that you all did, which was pioneering. And I called you and asked if you were thinking about Nevada and you were like, no. And I was like, but come on. <laughs> we got work to do so i'm just i am grateful for uh the work and for the work that you have all have done and you know that we can come along for the ride well we love you so much and people should know erica's over here talking about the black census and they were one of our highest performing partners in the black census project so you get bragging rights on that and i'm glad i listened to the pros so <laughs> that's how you get far in life and that was hard too Ooh, that was hard work <laughs> i didn't know what i was getting myself into when i asked the question <laughs> but aren't we glad we did my friend yes, so let's jump in I i'm wondering look i just read a whole long ass article okay mm -hmm. about job loss during the panty and what I saw was that women, by and large, were the largest losers of jobs. And in fact, Black women in particular, mm -hmm. in just the month of December alone, over 150,000 Black women were pushed out of the economy permanently, okay? That was in the month of December. So when we're talking about building back Boulder, right, this is absolutely 100% an issue of gender, an issue of race, and an issue of where those things meet in the middle. So talk to us about the economic state of Black women. And what does this American Rescue Plan have the potential to do to impact Black women's lives? You know, it's so hard to know where to start with this because as a Black woman, 
And as a Black woman who runs an organization that centers um, organizing with and for Black women, I know firsthand how how many intersections cross with us. And it always seems to be that we are at the brunt of all of the negativity. And anything that goes wrong, it seems to affect us first. You know, and I think that's because of the types of jobs that we hold. I think it's also because a lot of times we are the head of household. And with those things, if as you're the head of household and you end up with jobs that um are, are are deemed lower than some others, you are the first ones to be on the losing end of a lot of things. And so one of the things that I noticed with the Build Back Better plan um, was the child care component, which I'll be, I'll be honest, I was very excited about is one of the issues that we work on here at Make It Work Nevada is a quality affordable child care. So not just any old child care, but you know, most people don't realize that the cost of child care um, for a zero to around age three is more than college tuition. And so that makes entirely no sense to anybody. And it shouldn't, And because at the same time, most child care workers aren't even making a living wage. And so you'll have folks who have children and they, and they have the right to have children. They have the right to build the family the way that they want, but they also have the right to soar in their careers. But somehow or another, we're never able to do both. So what I, what is the potential from uh, Biden's plan would be for there to be a strong infrastructure around child care that makes it a public good, like public school schools, but better because we can have a whole conversation around public schooling. However, the idea that it's just all on your own and that, you know, the day daycare being so high, you know, I think most people just think that that's just the way that it is, but it doesn't have to be because if we really care about children and we really care about our future, then we need to be taking care of children from zero all the way through college. We need to make sure that they have that strong uh, educational foundation in order to soar so that we can be taken care of when we are older and so that the folks, the future doctors or lawyers or political activists or presidents or what have you, they have need to have a strong start. And someone in Head Start can very well be president as well as someone who went to uh, a fancier school. Mm -hmm. So let me ask, because, you know, um, a lot of how we got to this point, at least initially, and, you know, Dr. Hamilton, I... Um, referenced the uh <laughs> the most interesting popular front of all times between the, the unity task force between <laughs> president biden and presidential candidate at that time <laughs> senator bernie sanders look i mean we started off this conversation around a rescue plan really talking about getting back to the status quo but I think what we've seen over the last year, right, is that our communities were not good before the panty. <laughs> and so <laughs> you can't start at the, the deepest part of the hole and then only come up six inches, right? What does it take to actually get us up to parity, which is why we're talking about Build Back Boulder. So I want to yeah. ask you both, and, and Erica, I want to start with you, you know, what do you think we need to do to build the kind of power needed to address the economic issues that are facing our communities. And then Dr. Hamilton, I wanna to turn to you and ask you, you know, let's get specific about some of the ways, and Erica, this is for you too. Let's get specific about some of the ways, cause I hear there's a second STEMI coming. That's what I heard. So if we don't build back Boulder in the second STEMI, what are the things we need to be doing? Erica, let me start with you. Um, well, that's a lot, um, you know, the seams of this country are completely frayed. We're right. threadbare, you know, and it can't be patched together haphazardly, mended with some tape and glue. Like we actually have to start over on a lot of things. We actually have to come to a point and realize what we've done wrong and 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 how some of the foundation of this country was was um, we were built on uh, more like sand rather than concrete. And so in order for us to build back Boulder, we have to start at the at the root of the problem. And, and we can't like mosey around and be like, oh, here's a little bit of money over here. Here's a little bit of tax credit over here. That doesn't help folks who have lived in this cycle of poverty for generations. You know, some of the factors are outside of people's control. And I think, you know, we've spent a lot of time in this country 
uh, with the idea that poverty is individualistic. You know, it's not a community issue, but it is a community issue. And we are only as strong as our weakest point. So we start at those weakest points and we start to build back. And we do that by raising the wage, which is one of the things in the Build Back Boulder plan, uh, $15 an hour. But to be honest, we need to move past $15 an hour. That's not going to pay people's bills anymore. You know, we do need to structure, um, you know, a better child care. We need reparations is what we need. We need a lot of things in order to, and it needs to be bold and we can't baby step it. Like we're past the point of baby steps because people are dying and people aren't just dying from COVID. They're dying just from lack of resources. They're dying because they don't have uh, environmental justice. There's just a lack of fresh vegetables and, and things available in their area. They're dying because the schools um, are, are poor and, and just not adequate to teach anyone anything. So there's so many things that need to happen and they need to happen at the same time. You know, that's the other issue that I think we have all the time is that it's like, well, we'll do this now. And then next time we'll do this. And then next time we'll do that. You know, it reminds me of that meme of the skeleton in the, in the rocking chair. And, and we're waiting for, you know, all of this change. And the one thing won't fix anything because you could have $15 an hour, but it won't mean nothing if, if child care is too expensive or if housing is too expensive or police uh, are still uh, trailing you down the street and all of that. Like, None, it doesn't matter unless we fix everything at the same time. And we're able to walk and chew gum. It is so yes. completely possible. Yes, we are. Thank you. I want to encourage people who are watching right now, if you have questions for our panelists, you can go ahead and throw those in the chat as well. Dr. Hamilton, in the second STEMI, what do we need to do? Because, you know, we've been talking about not $2,000, period. $2,000 a month until the panty's over. And maybe yeah. just period. Let's get some guaranteed basic income going on. But I want to hear from you. What do you think needs to be done in this second STEMI so we can really build back Boulder? And, and let me say, Erica is killing it. So she, yep. she's putting out all the plans. So, um, you know, I have, can, I'm, I want to go back and just name two things based on uh, the conversation you had with her, which is even for those that are employed, women and black women in particular and some black men but particularly black women and latinx women were exposed to the virus they were crowded into occupations that made them more vulnerable to contracting the virus we that shouldn't go unstated also because this recession was different okay. in, in this case work was vulnerable for a long period of time um but yet they they were essential workers and and you know we should note that and then erica also mentioned uh the issue of being head of household we often think of household structure as an input, but it's an output. If we have better resource communities, regardless of household type, would it, you know, two men, two women, whatever, man, woman, if better resource communities, you're going to get better family structures. It is an outcome rather than an input. And it's the result of being, not having resources in the first place. Um, and then now thinking about what we need to do, um, again, building on Erica, we need a care economy. We need a economy that is focused on care from cradle to grave. Uh -huh. It is a public good, as Erica eloquently said, everybody's going to need care at some point in their life and needs care. And right. right now, there's an excess demand for care, and workers are treated horrible that, that are doing this work. And, and what's more, the federal government contributes over 70% to elder care through Medicaid and Medicare. It's not doing it. We can be more intentional and structured in how we do it, and make sure that the workers are a better resource and also that um, that the, the care itself is, is of better quality. And it would have gender effects. It would, we want people to have an authentic choice as to whether they gotta stay home and care for an ailing relative uh, versus we have a structure in society to make sure that we provide that care. That, that I think we need to do. So going back to the Biden administration, they wanna focus on they want to focus on in, uh, basically, uh, what is it, uh, industrial, industrial policy. So they want to build back our, our infrastructure, infrastructure. I think we need to reconceptualize industrial policy to not put firms first, but put workers and people first. Certainly, we need to invest in our infrastructure, but we need to do it in a way that the federal government is directly hiring people to do this work. I would love us to implement a federal job guarantee. With a federal job guarantee, we could have a green economy because the private sector is not green in our economy. We could have a care economy 
because the private sector is not providing that care. So we could direct our resources in a way, not just building bridges, although that's important as well, but making sure that we have quality care in so many dimensions, uh, because that's our most treasured resource, we are. And, and you know, this is not pie in the sky. And what else would a federal job guarantee do? It would be a direct mechanism to ensure everybody has a decent wage, decent benefits. And rather than dis disciplining poor people, it would discipline employers. If employers want to hire America's most treasured resource, it's people, then they're going to have to offer wages at least as high as what the public sector would hire. So, you know, I'm for basic income, like you had mentioned as well. Tax reform. It's about time we do some tax reform. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not, we need a wealth tax because we need to rein in plutocracy. It's a problem when the top 0.1% of earners own as much of our nation's wealth as the bottom 90%. That's a problem because they have too much power, because mm -hmm. they can dictate laws and structures like that. So that's a reason in and of itself why we want a wealth tax. But we certainly can afford to do a whole lot of things irrespective of raising taxes. We, we've demonstrated that. So EITC is already a current structure, but you know what? We arbitrarily exclude people that aren't working. EITC could be extended to non-workers as well. We could shift the whole structure up. And by the way, make it not just for working poverty, we could extend the phase out all the way up to the middle class. I'm not for UBI, everybody doesn't need income, but those that need it most, and as well as uh, some people that are struggling, well, we have a tax code that can proactively not just collect revenue, but ensure what, what I, I know I'm talking a lot. I'll stop in a no, second. You can, you can, come on. <laughs> America's biggest fiscal tool is tax policy. And what is the objective of a government? A government should have a fiduciary responsibility to provide economic inclusion, to provide social equity, and to provide civic engagement. And what better way through the tax code? And if we envisioned an EITC the way I'm talking about, and we have a paper that's gonna come out with more detail, um, then that would make the IRS proactively ensure that everybody's included. And tax day should be a damn holiday. We should have a, just like election day and everybody should take part in it. And that doesn't mean you, you have to pay, you might even get, get resources from the IRS. I love this, Dr. Hamilton. This is brilliant. So we have a couple questions from the audience. Erica, let me start with you. Where does canceling student debt fall into this conversation? It should be it should be at the top. Um, I think, and I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I know I've read in multiple places where uh, Black women are one of the most highly educated in the country, which means we probably carry a lot of this highly educated debt along with us. And so, again, it's just an added burden to uh, getting to our version of the American dream. So how are we going to... Um, actually get to that place where we are able to plant solid roots and 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 get into the next generation of having of them having the things and not having to restruggle when you're spending you know 20 years sometimes paying back student loans it's just it's unfathomable that they are that much and that they are allowed to uh charge interest that way and so i think that canceling student debt should be very much at the top because i think that college should be free also mm -hmm. come on Dr. Hamilton, what, is, what should reparations look like? Reparations, right? So um, the big old wealth gap, I think we need three things. As I mentioned, we need to tax the rich because they just have, <laughs> whether you're black or white, we have a distorted wealth distribution in America. It's too much concentration at the top. Um, <laughs> reparations is a necessary ingredient if we're ever going to get beyond our original sin. And there are multiple components to reparations. The truth and reconciliation, sometimes we gloss over it, but it is critical. The truth and reconciliation is not only for black people, it's for the American people in general, not just to cleanse our soul, but to redefine how we talk about poverty. Right now, we talk about poverty as if something's wrong with poor people. They have a deficit attitude or behavior. Uh, they, they simply uh, are dysfunctional in some way. And all that is racialized. I know I'm not telling y'all anything because y'all have done the work and talked about it, but all that's grounded in narratives of deadbeat dads, welfare teams, queens, and super predators. So if we do that truth and reconciliation, we have an authentic analysis of all the deprivation that was state sanctioned. And that's another key word. 
when people say, well, my family didn't do this or that, or my family came at this point or that other, your government did it. Your government allowed for um, policies that enrich one population at the exclusion of others, and I can get into detail. And what's more, when Black people were able to amass wealth, you know, we're coming up on the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre. Mm -hmm. So we had, you know, some people say there was a Black Wall Street. Well, whatever wealth and accumulation Black people had acquired in Tulsa was politically vulnerable through outright terror, not only their wealth, but their actual bodies. Mm -hmm. So the government was responsible for that. And Tulsa is not isolated. It's one that's commonly known. And matter of fact, that period of time is not isolated. It still goes on. So the case for reparations is clear. And the usefulness of the truth and reconciliation is to not only cleanse us, but to change narratives. Then it would be empty without forms of redress. So if we have reparations with truth and reconciliation without redress, it would be empty. And I, I you know, again, my fear is that I'm saying too much. So because I'm, I know this is supposed to be conversational, but I'll say one other point, which is, the form in which reparations takes place can be many forms. Um, one form that I would uh, think is essential is some transfer of either property or means of production. You know, we've all heard the Dave Chappelle joke that Black people will go out and buy Cadillacs if they're given a reparations check. You know, to some extent, who, who cares if they want Cadillacs, buy Cadillacs. Um, but what's problematic is we don't own stocks in Cadillac. And what you get is you get, a, you get a scenario where a multiplier effect gets created with that stimulus in a way that could actually harm us because we don't have ownership of the means of production. So mm -hmm. you could actually end up generating more inequality. So um, reparations should include, and, and other people have talked about other ways, black institutions, et cetera. But what's also essential is that we get capital in our reparations uh, uh, payments. And then, you know, I mentioned wealth tax reparations. I also think baby bonds is essential because what we need to recognize is reparations is a racially and economic retrospective approach towards justice. But what we also know is that capital, what does what it does best always, it consolidates, it cu accumulates, it iterates, and it excludes. So going forward, we're going to need something in perpetuity where the government ensures that everybody has a capital foundation, regardless of their race, gender. We know within households, families make decisions on which offspring they're going to leave a, a, an, an endowment or inheritance to. Well, we need public interventions to ensure as a birthright, you're going to have capital when you become an adult so that you can get into an asset like a home, a debt-free college education. And I'm with Erica, college should be free anyway. Um, and or some capital to start a business so you can have that economic security over your life. I love y'all. <laughs> I mean, I think we have time for one more question. So let me jump in. How can people who are kicked out of the workforce come back to working conditions that are better than from before the panty? Erica, can we start with you? What are your thoughts about this? I think we go back to talking about that care economy. Um, you know, something that we say all the time here, and I think Quentin says it is even more often than I do, our deputy director, uh, that um, care and, and having economic growth is not mutually exclusive. We can do both. And I don't think people realize that when, because backstory, Make It Work Nevada has been um, striving for and fighting for paid sick days and paid family leave for years now. And so, and, and we've been trying to bring it back this legislative session and folks are just not interested. Um, and by folks, I mean, some of our elected officials, some of our democratic elect elected officials don't see it as something that is necessary because it may hurt small business. I don't think so. Make It Work Nevada is a small business. We are a small nonprofit. There are only eight of us here. And the and and but I'm still able to offer a uh, full benefits. I'm offered I'm able to offer insurance, paid sick days, paid family leave. I have someone out right now who just had a baby and she won't be back until May. We figure it out and we make it work. And I think that other uh, businesses can do the same if we can have the mechanisms in place. There's no reason why that uh, someone who works hard and comes to work can't take time off to care for themselves or someone they that they love. And that's anyone, not just immediate family, mother and father. We all have some 
someone that we care dearly for, that we drop everything for and go take care of. And we should be able to do that and not be afraid that we're going to lose our job. There are people who just, um, you know, during this COVID incident that had, you know, folks were dying alone. And people were having to be buried and having you know, having to watch it on YouTube. Imagine if that's forever. Imagine if you're never able to actually be there for those people when you need to. It's un, it, it's it's inhumane, and it certainly wouldn't seem to be American to me. And so I think that in order for folks who have who have been removed from the the workforce, you know, when they come back, they need to come back to strong working conditions and protections. They need to come back to pay transparency so that, you know, Black women are, are paid less equally than almost anyone else. Um, you know, I think that we need to have uh, – we need we need to be protected all the way around because I think those who are protected they are they're loyal to their jobs they're loyal to their employers it's no reason to think otherwise if you're if you do good by them they'll do right by you so I think that we need to think about that instead of always concerned about well how much is this going to cost we will figure it out to say every every black mama knows how you get we're just gonna have to figure it out we can figure it out if we want to Listen, billions and billions of dollars on law enforcement. We can start there. Okay. Um, yeah. I said I was only going to ask one more. Uh, that was going to be the last question, but there's a really good one in here. So I got to do it. For both of you, uh, a lot of Black businesses have closed during the pandemic. Is there relief or assistance provided for them in the American Relief Plan? <laughs> Come on, Dr. Hamilton, you start. <laughs> Yes and no. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you just said it right. <laughs> on the one hand, on the other hand. What happened was. <laughs> so there's the Paycheck Protection Plan. Um, and we all know that in the first, that, well, throughout the delivery of the Paycheck Protection Plan, it has not been equitable and uh, along racial lines as to who's had access to it. And the reasons why are structural. Um, we have delivered the Paycheck Protection Plan through banks, and we know that Blacks and Black businesses are under under bank. If you have an existing uh, credit line of credit with a bank, then you're better able to get the get the the, the resource. Um, we know that our businesses in general are under resourced; they're undercapitalized. Why? Because of the massive racial wealth gap. Um, so, even public policy that may or may not be well intended, if you're not well positioned to receive it, you're vulnerable to it. And you, it might even hasten gentrification. You know what happens during economic downturn? We get bottom feeders that come in and buy assets at low prices. And when the market comes back up, uh, they benefit because they're better capitalized in the first place to benefit from it. So, you know, a key takeaway is that in our policy, we need to be anti-racist and anti-sexist. And what does that mean? In both design and implementation, we need to actively ensure that it's equitable on those lines. And Alicia, if, if I could just say, um, you know, I had to use my little cheat sheet to try to figure out if I could answer that question or not. And so, and it says that there is, um, there will be emergency grants um, from the Small Business Opportunity Fund to provide growth capital to Main Street small business and economically disadvantaged areas, including minority-owned businesses. The problem that I have with that is that minority could mean a lot of things. I needed to say Black. I needed to say woman. I needed to say the thing because minority can be a lot of things. And sometimes that still ends up being not black folks getting that help. And so if we want to build back voter, then we need to say what the thing is. We need to say that black people, um, you know, can get this, you know, and I think that that is just a, a really important, you know, underlying point to say that we can't we we can't pussyfoot around, um, you know, what is exactly needed. Mm -hmm. Can I get one quick thing in? Please, and, get in there. And, you, and just building on what Erica said, uh, thinking about people as opposed to geography makes us less vulnerable also. You know, those tax credits that come into Black neighborhoods hasten gentrica gentrification often because we're not capitalized enough to benefit from them in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we need targeted relief, right? And as we're talking about how to achieve racial justice, inside of economic recovery. We have to look at the communities that are falling behind. 
but we have to also look at the communities that never had a running start to begin with, <laughs> okay? So this is indigenous communities, this is black communities, this is Latinx communities, this is uh, Asian and Pacific Islander communities, right? So let's dive in. This is women, this is gender uh, queer folks, this is gender non-conforming people, this is trans folks who are also under attack about all the wrong things, okay? but that's gonna be another cyber cipher. <laughs> I gotta wrap us up y'all because you know we like to dip in and dip out. But if you wanna learn more about the Build Back Boulder mandate, please get your phone. I mean, you have your phone right now, but get it again. <laughs> and uh, text us at 510-405-4549. Text mandate to that number, 510-405-4549 to join our efforts to deliver a mandate from Black America, we need y'all to be a part of the change that we demand to see. And I have it on good authority that there is a second STEMI coming, which means that people are already in conversations about what that's gonna look like. So don't miss out. Don't have it be no conversation about you without you, child. That is a no-no. All right, let's fight to win, take the pledge, donate, and get a friend to do it too. We'll be back with an event on Tuesday, April 6th, giving you all the myths and facts about the Rona and the vaccines. You definitely do not want to miss that. Please follow Black to the Future Action Fund on all the socials. Thank you, thank you, thank you to Erica from Make It Work Nevada. Dr. Derek, you both are amazing. Don't forget to text MANDATE 510-405-4549. Love y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. <laughs> Peace out. Love you.